Hello and welcome to Love Work Live 60 Minute Mentor Webinars. I hope everyone's having a, a super week and uh, as people start to log in, uh, if you could just drop a quick note as normal into the Zoom chat room to say that you can hear us. I hope everyone's having a, a super week. Uh, it seems sort of, sort of the clients that Paul and I have been speaking to at the beginning of the week that the, there's a lot of green shoots starting to arrive, which is really, really pleasing to hear. And hopefully we're starting to break into the new dawn, let's call it from there. So as I say, if someone can drop a note into the, the chat room saying that they can hear us, that'd be very much appreciated. Um, I hope yeah, everyone can hear us. Something on mute. Ah, good. You're all uh, coming through nice and clear. Thank you, Tim. Okay, good. So people can hear us. Um, as we start this webinar, it's quite an interesting sort of view. Uh, relaunch or restart. Um, Paul and I, as always, sort of sit down a couple of days before we, we do the webinars and start to sort of break through what we want to talk about and create sectors. And we start to, to normally create about four or five sectors for each webinar. When we got to about point 12 on this one, we stopped counting because they just kept coming and coming. So the way we're going to run the webinars from now on, we believe it is all about restart. It's not about relaunch. It's about restarting your business and pushing your business forward. Forward. So what we're going to start to look at is plans and strategy. So we've put these in an order of relevance that we think of the things that we need to start with. If we get to the end of today's webinar and we haven't covered anything, then we're going to bump it across into next week's because we've got so much content. We think it's going to be a really interesting webinar. So let's start off, Paul. As people come in, we're sort of, the people are still coming and there's quite a number of, uh, already in. It's quite a busy webinar as always, which is good. So let's kick off, Paul. Um, very very quickly first thing you know we're talking about relaunch or restart we believe this is a restart to your business you're not relaunching you're not going out and doing a complete rebrand and relaunch this is about restarting your business what do you think the first thing we should be actually genuinely doing when we look to restart and redo our business well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's great to uh, be here. Um, and uh, although we can't see you, thanks for joining us once again. Um, gorgeous day outside. Um, just a, to answer Howard's question, I think we have this amazing opportunity now to um, relaunch our businesses. I mean, we, we titled this or entitled this Relaunch or Restartup. And I, I think, in a sense, we, we really want to be thinking as uh, this is a, almost like a startup, I mean, a restartup in that we've all had three, four months to step back in a sense of once in a lifetime opportunity to think hard about all the things we were doing prior to the lockdown. Were they working? What was working well? What was driving us crazy? How do we think we want to change things going forward? What does the market want from us? as we start to move forward. And I think to kind of now ignore that opportunity, this chance to reflect calm opportunity to stop and think deeply about the future, to ignore that and go back in and do exactly what we were doing prior to the COVID crisis seems a shame to me. We do know that, and everybody agrees that the market has changed. Um, the world of work we know will change. I don't think there can be any doubt that as we come back into the world of work, <clears throat> we're going to see a very different landscape, not just in the short term whilst we're still going through the crisis, but in the longer term. And here's the opportunity we've been waiting for for a very long time to really increase the level of our service to our candidates, to our clients, to embrace technology, to consider what our strategies will be going forward. And I think one of the first things that you are probably doing right now is thinking very hard about your strategies, your plans for the future, and start to and starting to interact in a very deep and meaningful fashion with the people that are in your business. And I, I know Howard, I think we spoke about this yesterday. We were talking around how do you interact with your guys? How do you get them involved in the planning? Um, what are you going to do in order to get them to buy in? hearts and minds into what we call a, re, a restart, a restart up. I think it's a very interesting, I think, Paul, you know, that getting your staff as involved in part of that planning is really important, that sense of belonging. And I always said, I said, I think I said this on last week's webinar, is when you plan a journey, 
it's the planning that really excites you about that journey and it's the planning that really gets you sort of in the mood that you that's what you want to do this is what you're looking at from a journey's perspective and it's those plans that start to take shape once the journey starts to happen it's the plans that you've made that excite people because they feel part of that journey therefore when you're passing milestones they feel elated that they're passing milestones because they're not part of things that they were part of bringing together and joining together so i think the first thing is to sort of be very mindful that your people have been out of the uh, organization for quite some time and therefore bringing them back in and helping that you to plan your recovery which is their recovery i think is really really important howard i did some work um funny enough it wasn't in the recruitment industry i did some work for a pretty well-known charity um probably about five six years ago now um and we did um quite a lot of work around surveys with the the people in the business with the people in the charity and we sent out um a questionnaire uh, i think it was through something like survey monkey or something like that um, but it was quite a comprehensive questionnaire. Um, we asked people to respond right across the organization. There was a, quite a number of employees. Um, it was anonymous. We didn't want them to say who they were. And um, we spent a lot of time putting those questions together to try and understand the feeling within the organization, how the employees felt the organization needed to move forward, how it needed to be improved, their sentiments and emotions towards the charity and so forth. What we also did was we then all, we conducted one-to-one one -one interviews with a selected number of people, quite a large number of people actually. Um, again, we used identical, there was two of us at the time and we used identical questions um, and we sat down and had one hour interviews with each individual. And the interesting thing was, you know, when we combined the qualitative, and that's not an easy word to use at this time of the morning, and quantitative uh, information, we came up with, and we did a SWOT analysis, good old fashioned SWOT, SWOT analysis, various other analyses. We came up with 53 different recommendations to make to the charity in terms of change. Some of them quite radical change, some fairly minor changes, and the charity adopted 50 of those changes we recommended. And I remember the CEO was thrilled with the feedback we got. And what we got was honesty. We got honesty from the people within the organization and those people closest to the people they were caring for through this charity. And it made a significant difference. And I would urge people listening today to follow suit. Consider sending out a questionnaire to your people. Consider one-on-one -on -one, um, mentoring. We, talk, we spoke a lot about that last week, but mentoring call, um, and an interview to draw out from your guys and collectively from the business exactly how they feel about the company, your company, exactly what they think should be done going forward in terms of making the changes and immerse them in the, the changes. Don't dictate to them, immerse them. If they believe rightly that what you're now doing as you relaunch your business, you restart up your business, has to a large degree had their input you will also get their buy-in and when you get their buy-in you'll get their commitment to making the changes which is far preferable than telling people what to do and we know what happens when we do that uh, you'll get some people that will do what you want them to do uh, with a heavy heart and others that will just refuse to do it so i think you need involvement and this idea to do uh, anonymous questionnaires one-on-one -on -one conversations regarding the strategies and plans for the future is very important now i think that's really a, a great point as well, you know, Paul, we've done that with a number of clients since then, uh, helping them where they have what we call a toxic environment to try to change their environment around and improve their sales culture and their business culture. We've got to understand that people have been out of the business and furloughed for an awful long time now, over three months. So coming in, they're going to be nervous on various different things. How's the business changed? What's the business going to change like? And I think that type of satisfaction survey with qualitative and quantitative sort of um, it, it, data will really help the management to start to streamline their business and we go back to that looking at strengths and looking at weaknesses and if we can find the strengths and weaknesses within the organization that the people 
feel and we can start to change that and we can start to change a more collaborative driven culture then we start to get a far better sales performance from businesses as well we know so i think that employer satisfaction survey is really really important to drive and work from there i always look at another thing once you've started to write your plan and get your plan down and once you start to understand the temperature let's call it of your employees and how they feel about going back out into the market how they feel about the business you need to start to really analyze your business quite extensively and i always talk about analyzing your your business and analyzing your roles and requirements uh, and i've done this just recently with a with a client where we looked at all the current positions that they'd worked in the last 12 months and what we looked at was rather than looking at their fill ratio, we looked at the actual jobs that they worked. And then we looked at the actual type of jobs that they filled. And what we found was, which is your traditional Pareto's 80-20 law, that 80% of the jobs that they work, were working, they very seldom filled. And it was 20% of the jobs that they were working that they were getting most of their fill rate from. And we could drive that. So once we looked at the percentage of the roles that they were working, what we then started to focus on is clients that had the type of roles that the client was, uh, the, the agency was expert at filling. And we start to analyze very heavily at those roles. So we looked at the clients, we looked at the candidate base and what was going. And we changed a two out of 10 placement ratio to a six and a half out of 10 placement ratio within about four or five months. Mm -hmm. And then we moved that on to another stage and got that to above seven which meant 70% of the time that the consultants were working they were filling requirements rather than 20% of the time that they were working they were filling requirements and so that sudden feeling of I'm just playing you know canvassing roles on for sake for uh, you know for KPI sake disappeared the flip side of that was being able to then to go back to clients and look at the client analysis with the client and saying, look at these roles that you give us, Mr. Client. These type of roles we are brilliant at filling. These roles we're not great at filling. We want to find out why we're not great at filling. So we're not saying we reject those roles, but there's a great opportunity to go back to the client and understand why you're not filling it. Sometimes you might have a client that won't change their work process or won't change their job specification. You know they're not going to find that type of person. Then you have a choice then to reduce your working with that client or remove it completely. But I think what we've got to start to think about is being very more strategic about data and looking at that requirement analysis and driving our consultants towards clients where we are going to have a better opportunity to fill roles and therefore using their strengths more often than not and once people start to engage in their strengths on a more regular basis they start to feel more engaged with the business rather than feeling like they're failing constantly because if you know i know about that feeling if you're only feeling two out of ten eight percent of the time you're, you're, you're losing it's not a great feeling if we can change that round which means being more selective with the requirements that we work i think we can start to really change the view of how agencies are perceived by clients but also internally how we create a mindset of kpis rather than just kpis for kpi's sake well you you, you lead me into something really interesting howard and this is you know, a real hobby horse of mine and i mean as you know i've been working in the recruitment industry since the last king died um so and the thing that's always wound me up uh it's still the case is the fact that as an industry and god knows how this ever happened we work for we work for no money we we're no win no fee I mean, you're hard pressed to find too many other industries that have done what we've done as an industry sector. Um, obviously, exec search people have been much more sensible and intelligent and have charged in advance for their efforts. But the rest of us, um, and that's most of the industry, have forever worked on vacancies that we have no guarantee of filling um, and often put in endless hours or days or weeks into assisting organizations that we never make money from. And I think. One of the things that I've, I really feel very strongly about, because we've had this pause button called the COVID crisis, is the opportunity we now have to kind of spin this, to start to talk to organizations and companies around um, working exclusively and in a retained position with them. Just because the exec search guys very sensibly and intelligently have used this model doesn't mean that, our, our, you know, that contingent recruiters can't follow suit now. We talked a lot about 
using video platforms, um, the Zooms and the Go webinars and the Skypes and the Microsoft Teams to, to enable us to connect, to talk to clients face to face, to talk to candidates face to face, to facilitate meetings um, remotely. And that, of course, leads to these exclusive opportunities the opportunity to get some money up front, uh, a small sum of money, one third or a set fixed sum of money. Um, and that gives us, I think, the chance to work with clients who are um, keen to see a result. If you pay money for something, you are much more likely as a client to follow through, answer emails, take phone calls, participate in interviews when we need that to happen and see the process through rather than the typical situation where people are not paying money in advance and therefore we use countless different recruitment businesses and we get used as a CV chucking service. What we have to do is take a stand now and start talking to our customers as true consultants, as true experts, rather than CV chuckers. And I know everybody listening to this will be 100% in agreement with me. Now, I do accept that this is a change of, um, of scenery for our clients. It's a change of attitude. And we can't necessarily expect that everybody is going to jump on board to the new world that we're, we're going to try to propagate. I, I, I know that 70 to 80% of customers will want us to operate in the way that we operated in pre-March. But I think it's, it's a challenge for us. And I think it's something we need to work with our staff about and train them and coach them so that we can start to shift, shift the, the attitude of customers over a period of time by using technology, by working more closely, by building that trusted advisor positioning with them. Uh, and I, I, I think this is a great opportunity for us to do that. Of course, we'll always have contingency recruitment as, a, as an, um, a part of what we do, but it would be wonderful if we could move from 100% contingency to something around the 50-50 mark. And there's no reason in my, in my book why we can't achieve it. We're going to have to fight hard. We're going to have to challenge. But look, uh, right now we've got a, a huge number of people listening to this webinar. If every one of these business owners listening to us, Howard, went off and started to talk to customers about working in this fashion, and it became the norm in the industry, clients would come on board. Um, so people, you shouldn't be a lone voice. Let's work together in trying to get our clients to recognize the value we bring to their business. And when there's value, then there's the opportunity for us to charge something for that. Um, we've got to move away from being regarded as nothing more important than CV chucking. I think some of that comes back to what we're talking about doing with our own staff is doing the same thing with our clients, actually surveying clients and finding out what they truly want and what they truly require from a recruitment agency. And this is not just about what they required in the past, but what they require in the future. And I think if we start to understand, because obviously clients are going to go through a huge transition as they start the new world of work, their whole business will transition. And therefore, we need to transition with them. So understanding them would be a real great starting point. So when you start to analyze your clients, we talked about lapsed clients and new clients, you know, who do you actually want on your target list and who should be on your target list are really important. But then actually finding out what clients want. If you do a survey across a number of clients and certain things are starting to highlight it by all clients, and you're doing that and you're getting ahead of other agencies that aren't doing those type of things, then all of a sudden you have a, an edge in the marketplace. You have a lead into the marketplace because you understand more of what a client wants. It's very interesting that, you know, I know sort of when we in the 2008 recession hit, um, I did a, a small survey on a large number of the contract clients that I was dealing with at the time. And they came back with lots of different ideas of how they wanted to engage with recruitment agencies. And that gave us an opportunity to change how we approached those companies and how we could add, it, add extra service to those, those companies. But we would have never have known those type of things if we hadn't gone out and pointedly ask for those type, that type of information. So I think in this type of market, we have to go out and start to really test the temperature of our client base as well as our, as our consultant base. And it's important once we understand that, then you can start to build 
a genuine candidate base that can fill the client's needs. So, here, so Howard, I think this is a really, really good point. We've had a lot of questions from people around, do we diversify? Do we go into other sectors? Should we stick with what we already do? And I think to a large extent, that really, really depends on your candidate pool, your talent pool. You know, if you're going to enter a new sector, <clears throat> there's a number of different risks around that. That's not to say you shouldn't do it, um, but let's look at the risks. If you move away from what you already know, where you're an expert, you know, and it, it reflects your experience, your background, your knowledge, and importantly, your talent pool, and you're going to move into somebody else's space, because let's be honest, you're not going to find a sector that isn't already well served by other recruitment businesses. The question then is, what are you going to provide to those customers, those clients, that your competitors in this new sector are not providing? Um, now, it may be as simple as, you can find the talent that your competitors cannot find it more, more readily, more easily. Fine. If that's the case, then, then crack on. But then again, you also need to have the same level of knowledge and uh, an experience or at least an understanding, a strong understanding of that particular sector. Otherwise, you're going to sound like an amateur. And the, I think one of the bigger issues is that if you are going to move into other sectors and you do not have succession planning in your business, you haven't got people that can step into your shoes and take on the responsibilities for managing your core sectors, then you run the risk of spreading yourself too thinly and end up earning very little. You don't make an impact in the new sector and you've um, taken your eye off the ball in terms of your existing sector. And I, I remember reading about Alan Sugar when he was talking about his biggest mistake in business was, in his opinion, buying Tottenham Hotspur, which is an Arsenal supporter always makes me smile. But his point was that when he moved in and became the owner of Spurs, um, his business Amstrad was doing extremely well in taking on IBM back in the day, when in, when in the early days of word process and word processors and home computers. And he, he didn't have a great experience at Spurs. By the time he got back into the computer market, uh, the market had changed and moved and his market share had disappeared and he had to restart all over again. And he said, you know, had he stuck with what he knew well at the time, i.e. taking on IBM, he would have done a whole lot better than moving into an area, i.e. football, that he knew very little about. Now, it's a well-known story, but it's a reasonable story. If you're going to diversify, you need to be very clear about what you're going to achieve, who you're going to take on, how you offer better services, different services, and be clear that you've got staff that you trust, who you can delegate to, who can look after the shop, who can take care of your core business. Because if you haven't got that, you run a huge risk that you will ultimately decimate your business. You have to be extremely careful. Um, there was a question from one of our listeners who owns a legal recruitment business. This is one of the sectors, Howard, that is, you can't say anything is recession proof, but it's certainly one of those professions that is less likely to be hurt by the recession than most. And I think when you look at some of the recruitment sectors, finance, legal, as good examples, medical is another example, and there are various others, I think these are brilliant sectors and worth sticking with rather than necessarily moving into other sectors that are, are buffeted greatly by recessionary climates. I think you're right that diversification is always hard, but I do feel if you're going to diversify, then you should look at things that are closely linked with your core niche markets that you're already w working on. And therefore the, the chasm of the leap across from one sector to another isn't too huge. And you've already got a ready-made client base where your sector or your, your niche might not be recruiting where another sector might be within your type of client base. So I'd always look to drive that across and work from there. The other side that you talk about that, Paul, which is, is quite interesting, is the quality of the consultants within the marketplace who are able to recruit in those sectors. And we always talk about, you know, do you bring new people into the marketplace and train them in your fashion? Or do you bring recruiters that have got experience within that marketplace and we all know that bringing recruiters in isn't a recipe of success quite a large number of time. So you've got to really make sure that if you are going to diversify, that you spend time 
finding the right people that will actually break or, or, or broker that market for you rather than just bringing in somebody that has another experience a set or experience in another sector that you just want to think well i can take them from one sector and into another sector never underestimate the market knowledge that you require when first starting up a sector and growing a sector hence why when we talk about here this isn't relaunch this is restart Relaunch would be going into new sectors, doing lots of different things, which means that you've got to do an awful lot of legwork before you start to start to see return on your investment coming out of those sectors. Where I think if you are hitting your niche market and hitting it really hard and then diversifying outside of your niche, but linking back into your niche, you've got a far better way of actually creating an opportunity for you than just openly going into a, into a new sector. And I, I would add something here, I think, that's just really important for everybody listening to be thinking hard about. And that is, if you're going to do new things, and, and I would advocate you do, um, and we'll, come, we'll keep talking about those new things. The question is, what are you going to stop doing? Because we can't, unfortunately, create more hours in the day. We can't create more days in the week, um, perhaps as much as we'd like to. But the truth is that in order to focus on new things, you've got to stop doing other things. So the question is, what other things are you going to stop doing? And I think every one of us will recognize when we review the way we spend our time that, and we spoke about this right at the beginning of this discussion, um, where are you working in areas that lead to pretty limited levels of, um, of reward? Where, what are you doing in terms of using your space and time that enables you to um, make more money. So what can you do in terms of your experience, your skill set, your strengths that will make a difference in your business? What do you stop doing where you recognize you spend an inordinate level of time that, that generates limited or no revenue? And I'll give you some examples. So all of us that have managed recruitment businesses will spend and have spent and do spend a huge number of our hours working on minutiae, um, areas that we think are urgent, but actually result in limited or no revenue for us. Some of those areas re are relevant to managing staff, for example. So, you know, working with people who frankly, perhaps shouldn't be in our business. Um, so one of the things we need to be thinking about as we relaunch our businesses is to look at the people we have in our organization. Are they the right people to take you forward? If they are brilliant, wonderful, we need to be really looking at how we coach, train them, retrain them, reskill set them in order that we can help, they can help us to really relaunch and develop our business in the new world of work. Or is it the case that we have people that are very strong in some areas, but are actually weak in others? And we'll come back to this point about 360 degree recruiters in just a second. You know, the best managers, the people that really do brilliantly in business actually spend 60 to 70 percent of their time looking outside of the business working outside of the business i.e talking to clients attending meetings attending conferences networking becoming a noise in their space and instead most of us get trapped into spending 60 to 70 percent of our time working inside of our businesses and not doing the things that will provoke and develop our strategies if you're going to change anything going forward you really need to be spending far more time looking outside of the company, what's going on in your markets, what's going on in your sectors, what's happening with your businesses, your clients, your candidate talent pools, really spending time looking outside of the company. And I appreciate only too well, that's very, very difficult. If you have a small business, then you have to be, as they call it these days, on the tools, arranging interviews, making placements. I get that, I know it's difficult but you do need to be looking at the balance of your working time. How much time are you working outside of the business instead of inside of the business? And we all of us, including me, need to make those adjustments if we're gonna develop our businesses going forward. I think it's quite interesting. We've talked to this an awful lot and I think we, we, we created a whole uh, discussion topic at, it, at the expo in London at the beginning of the year about what recruiters tend to do is they tend to work on what is urgent 
rather than what is strategically important. And as you get further up the, the line, irrespective of how small your business is or how big your business is, as you become more and more management led, you tend to focus sometimes on what is urgent for the company rather than what is strategically important. Usually what is urgent is filling jobs. And if we start to look at that and go back on the analysis we talked about earlier on, if you're spending 80% of your time filling or trying to fill roles that will only a very small percentage will come to fruition, then you're wasting an awful amount of time within your business because you're doing what you believe is urgent. Where you could proportion that time into things that are strategically important for, to grow your business and therefore you'll be able to expand your business far quicker if you actually al allocated that time. So that really sort of leads into a sort of a question, Paul, that we talked about quite a lot over the last sort of three or four months. We've been talking about this ourselves, about what do we stop doing to provide ourselves with time so we can start doing the things that will make a significant difference in the business and move forward. And, and look, I think there's a number of things we need to be doing. You know, one of them is unquestionably, and I know we've banged on about this a lot, and um, there are lots of our clients that are <clears throat> definitely adopting this principle. Let's, let's embrace technology. I don't want to get into that too deeply today because we've spent a lot of time talking about it in previous webinars, but you know, let's get on with it. Let's, let's embrace the technology that's out there, the artificial intelligence that is already in our sector. Um, and let's start to invest in it because, you know, we want the robots to do the grunt work. You know, why are we going to spend the next X number of years manually searching for CVs on job boards, on, on our database, on, on social media, when we can get the robots to do it for us? Um, you know, we know the big corporations are using applicant tracking systems or candidate tracking systems. You know, we need to get into this. Very few recruitment businesses I'm aware of presently invest in ATS, CTS technology. We're going to need to do that. Uh, we're going to need to look at using the video platforms, which, as we've said many times, are going to become more and more sophisticated, easier to use, and far more complementary to our businesses which drives us towards the exclusive retained opportunities we talked about earlier. Let's, let's get on with it. Let's invest in those areas. Let's be the first kid on our block to use these technologies and to allow our people to really start to exercise their skills, their inert ability to develop relationships. You know, people have asked me many times recently, what kind of people are we going to be employing going forward who are going to be right for the modern era? And it makes me smile because the reality is they're the very same traits that I've been engaging and employing from people, in people, since the 70s. The truth is that our era, the new era, is all about emotional intelligence. We need people who are very comfortable and very capable of building relationships with clients, particularly, and candidates by using their uh, ability to be perceptive, to be sensitive, to be sympathetic, empathetic, all of these adjectives. Um, but these are things we know, all of us, can't be taught at school or university. It's part of who we are. It's part of our DNA. We're hardwired in this direction. We need people that can develop those relationships, who are active listeners, who are very keen to spend time talking to clients and candidates, that see communication in the old-fashioned sense, exactly what we're doing now, <clears throat> as critical to, to developing relationships. Let's let the robots do the other stuff. Let's engage people who have these great personalities to engage with our clients and candidates and develop those relationships. You said earlier, Howard, and you're completely right, we're talking about questionnaires with our people, one-to-one -one interviews with our people, absolutely, but we need to be having those in-depth conversations with our clients. How are we going to know what the market's going to do or what our clients are going to do unless we're deep within those organizations? And as owners, we can't take on that responsibility purely. It's not just our jobs to go and speak to clients and get into their, into their information, their data, their designs, their visions, their goals. We need people around us that can do that. 
I think it's quite an interesting view that we, we, we talk an awful lot on these webinars and we're talking about the sales people, et cetera. What we don't often talk about is the back office people that sometimes, you know, whether that be a paid back office person or something that you've outsourced and what effect that they can have on the business and the time that they can save you on the business. You know, I was working with a client the other week and they were talking about uh, they'd been working on some very large projects and all the candidates needed a certain criteria and certain skill sets and they'd invested in a tool that allowed them to view over 1500 candidates instantly and have them vetted within 24 hours which gave them a very small candidate pool then of the candidates that actually had the right required skill set and the right required um i suppose uh, technical ability etc to deliver the job and therefore they save themselves a massive amount of time going through all of those people and that was all, all automated what well, that means that they had a, a list of candidates that they just went to instantly for that type of role in a contract market so I think that came from if I remember right speaking to the client one of their back office staff had said why don't we do this and they'd engaged in some technology that could do that and it saved their sales staff a huge amount of time so anything that we can do that can automate a business is really really important and I think as always when we start to automate a business the simpler it is the easier it is for the consultants to abide by and take on and therefore if you put your CRM at the heart of your business and make that the beating pulse of what everything runs through then all of a sudden all your consultants have to do is go to one place to your CRM and then have their outlook open and that is basically all they need to do yes they'll need a, a, a web browser open but other than that they shouldn't be opening anything else during the day and therefore they're maximum their time on what they're doing so I think it's really important that we start to look at that and take some of the grunt work out of recruitment at this moment in time which leads me again to the uh, other grunt work, Paul, that, yes. sort of, that we all do, is we are still very much in love with the 360 environment. I thought you were going to say that's what I was about to jump in and say. Yeah, you know, and whether or not 360 works is a whole debate on its own. Yep. But, but my view is if you start to look at the attrition rate in recruitment in the first three, six to 12 months, surely it starts to say that the 360 model is either broken and can't be fixed or it needs a complete overhaul and replaced. And I think there's a sort of view and there's, there's lots of people with their feet in different camps. And I think you've got to look at your business to see whether or not are you succeeding as a 360 business or not? And if you're not, what else could you do that would then provide your clients with customer satisfaction that would mean it would increase your placement to requirement ratio over a period of time? And I think that is really important that we start to focus on those type of things, changing our delivery mechanism to clients to ensure that when we go out into the marketplace, not only are we the best in the marketplace for having a candidate uh, product to offer, but also when we offer a client a service that the satisfaction that they receive from that service is extremely high. And again, measuring that satisfaction therefore becomes a priority to gauge whether or not your clients feel there is value. And as Paul talked about earlier on, if we want to create value, once the clients feel that they are creating value, then we can start charging more for our services and getting paid up front rather than getting paid only on success rates. And there's a very, very big difference because what it says to me at the moment is the fact that some clients are getting retained business, the search market gets almost 100% retained business, says that there are clients there that actually value the service and therefore will pay for it. So it's not a huge leap of faith for a client, but it's a huge leap of faith for the agency to change their delivery mechanism into clients to create value, which means that you get paid for the work which is a far different position to be in rather than being a contingency recruiter fighting for that fee all the way through. So just to your point about 360 degree recruiters, Howard, I mean, you know, I've spent my entire life in this industry looking for or trying to train people to be 360 degree recruiters. And decades ago, I realized, as I'm sure our listeners have realized that 
finding these people is like looking for hen's teeth. I mean, the truth is to find somebody who can, who's perfectly comfortable resourcing, perfectly comfortable interviewing candidates, perfectly comfortable getting on the phone and identifying business opportunities, capable of creating interviews, coaching candidates for interviews, coaching clients for interviews, um, negotiating fees, going out and meeting clients, arranging meetings, um, uh, writing proposals, um, closing uh, placements, or getting contractors or temps out, um, after sales service mentoring. I mean, I mean, what kind of lunatic industry genuinely believes that people can do all of those things really well? I mean, we do. It, it seems crazy when you think about it. Uh, I would consider myself as close to a 360 degree recruiter as anybody. I'm, and I know you feel that way. And I'm confident that the people listening to us feel that way. But how many people, as you said earlier, have fallen by the wayside? Because really, what we're asking of them is beyond them. And that's not their fault. We're, we've put together a job description that is virtually impossible for anybody uh, to tick all of its boxes. So why not reconsider the way we go forward? Look at people that you already have working with you as you identify, as you go through with them, what they're seeking in the new era and look at their skill set, look at their strengths. Where will they excel and use them in those areas? So, you know, if you look at a placement process, as I did with a client earlier in the year, um, I literally, with a huge whiteboard, went through every element of the process and I found, I think, 26 different elements of the process from advertising, looking for candidates, social media searching, through to a placement and then the after-sales service of mentoring, and I think came down to 26 different units. And then we chunked that up and we looked at the skill sets of the people that work, were working in the business. And we realized very, uh, very quickly, some people were brilliant on the phone, closing deals, doing business development. Some people were really comfortable researching or resourcing and so forth. And we started then to reassign responsibilities and duties to those people. And, and to your point, you know, we created some new roles. We had candidate care consultants, people that would take care of candidates, prepare them for interviews, um, coach them through that, um, take care of them from the point when they accepted roles to when they started in their new jobs, taking care of them after through mentoring. And we took that responsibility away from the guys that all that, that were desperate to make deals, want to be on the phone, arranging interviews, getting placements made, because they weren't interested in that tactile stuff. It just passed them by. You talk to those guys about mentoring, they don't want to do it. They've made a placement, they've had a deal, they want, they're on to the next deal. So we kind of looked at their strengths and weaknesses and we mixed and matched. And it's back to that Ford Model T um, process we've talked about many times, Howard. You know, you don't get 200 men in a, in, a, in, a, in a factory to build 200 cars each, one each. You don't do that. And yet our industry is, has done this since the dawn of time. Here's our opportunity to look at the strengths of our people and consider how we complement them working closely with each other, using strengths and weaknesses to develop a better system. And I think exactly to your point, look at what your customers want, design your business around customer and candidate satisfaction. Consider what they want and what works for them and think backwards from that position. Don't think what's right for us and work from that position backwards, which is unfortunately what lots of organizations do. You think about the hours you're gonna be working going forward. I think we'll be looking at not 24 seven work, but I definitely think we'll be looking at extended hours to look at what works for our candidates and our clients. And we'll be looking at shift systems for our consultants. It may even be that we'll be working on Saturdays uh, because that's the time when candidates can speak to us very comfortably, for example, before everyone screams and shouts that, you know, we're going to be asking our guys to work longer hours or more days. I'm not saying that I'm saying we will look at shift systems and considering what works for the business. And in turn, what may well work very well for our people, giving them a better work life balance. Then this is the opportunity we've got, but at the, at the heart of everything you decide to do, you place the interests of your candidates and clients first and foremost, and work backwards from there. I think the only sort of slight thing I'd change on that is you put your consultants 
first and then your candidates and clients after that and i think what we're yep. talking about is that shift in work-life balance is that you know i remember certainly when i started in recruitment in the in the early 90s that you know you were working weekends you were working late at night but you were still expected to be in work you know, if work started at half past eight, you were expected in really to be in at eight o'clock. If it finished at half past five, you were expected to be really be there till seven o'clock, etc. And they were the expectations of recruitment. And generally what I tend to found was lots of people yeah, would come early, but they wouldn't do anything until nine o'clock started and they'd stay late and do zero. They'd almost be working to rule type scenario. And I think that again goes back to what type of people will start recruit because they'll be the people that have the passion and the drive to actually deliver a service to a client. And therefore what you'll have is you'll have the trust in that person and you'll be able to say to that person, okay, work the hours that you deem fit to fill your requirements. And that working from home capability, you know, do you go to a four day week? Do you go to a, a more relaxed hour type scenario? It means that people will be trusted to work. And when people start to be trusted, their delivery starts to increase because they feel trusted. So I think what we're talking about is really changing that mindset of a recruiter um, and delivering a service to a client. Because remember, service doesn't stop just because half past five appears and service doesn't stop or start just at nine o'clock you know service is constantly going on and you've got to start to think about that mind shift of a business if you can create a really good work-life balance for your consultants they will create a great opportunity for your clients and your candidates to create opportunities to make placements for yourself because you need both the candidate and the client to make the placement and turn that into cash Therefore, you have to be working both markets. And I know when we talked about 360 recruiters, Paul, you know, a long time ago, and we, we sat down and said, could we sort of go through who we thought were the best 360 recruiters? We only came up with a very, very small list, a very small handful of people. And then we started to look at people, well, this person would be great if we put them in that type of role, that person would have excelled in that type of role. And we start to talk about how much attrition that would have saved us and how much cost from a business point of view would that saved us overall from not having to re-recruit another 360 recruiter that you knew in six months wasn't likely it's going to work out because the stats were saying that. And yet we were still being forced down that avenue by the, the gods that be at the time. And I think we've now got a, a, an opportunity to really refresh and change that and lead that. So I think it's a real big drive towards the mindset of a recruiter and the people that you take on board so i think if you've got to start thinking about if you can get that employee satisfaction right and the right people working in your business if you then get that client satisfaction right and you can understand what a client wants for from from your business then that just leaves one section that just leaves the candidate section how often do we truly analyze how a client sorry how a candidate feels after our recruitment process. What in-depth analysis do we do on a candidate that then links everything back together? So if we start to think we've done a lot of analysis on a, a, a analytical work on our own staff and we start to change our business to ensure that they feel empowered to deliver for us, we now understand what the clients want. Surely we need to understand what the candidates want as well to ensure that we work there, which then sort of leads that there are three separate planes within the, the recruitment game. There is that creation of new business and driving new business. And most companies that I go to, most people say they don't like new business, but there are a few out there that love new business and love knocking down doors. And then there are those that love to deliver and delivery comes in two sections. You're either good at finding candidates or you're good at dealing with a client once you've got a, a client to deliver to. And so they start now into their three sections that we could really, really, you know, work on. Salesperson, requirement filling person, and a candidate person. If you have those type of three types of people, and you might get one or two morphing into each, each role, but if you split those roles out and then start to look at your business and as Paul said, look at where you have got strengths and where you have weaknesses, then you'll start to see where you can start to grow a business that is based on strengths rather than based on old fashioned KPIs and an old fashioned mentality of 
360, we're all going to build one car each every single day. And I think there's a huge change to be had there. So Howard, I mean, I think if you, you know, we know quite a few people listening to us today <clears throat> and without exception, the people I know listening have all got outstanding personalities, really magnetic personalities. And one thing that everybody has in common is that they're outstanding communicators. <laughs> Tim saying, thanks, Paul. Um, and that includes you, Tim. Uh, it's true. And, you know, you, you guys have got wonderfully high emotional intelligence. This is, this is not rocket science. This is what we're looking for in our business. We need outstanding communicators. <clears throat> I consider myself very fortunate that for over 40 years, I've, done, I've, I've made a very good living, if you, if you put it in that sense, and I had a great career in doing something that, frankly, has been fairly easy for me. I've been communicating. I'd like to think I'm a pretty good communicator. In fact, I'd like to think I'm an excellent communicator. And I think that's what we're looking for, people with high emotional intelligence who can build relationships, who have outstanding communication skills. And if we've got people in our business that have those attributes, which are fairly natural, that's brilliant. We can work with those guys. But if you've got people who really aren't particularly good communicators, can you use them in other areas of the business where they're not being asked to contact and speak to candidates or clients? Because if you can use them in those areas, great. If not, frankly, you've got the wrong people in your organization. We know very well what makes brilliant consultants. It hasn't really changed in the 40 odd uh, years I've been in the industry. Um, and I, I think this is, is extremely important as we go forward. I think one of the other things that I'd add in here, Howard, when we take, you know, what are we going to do that's different going into the, the new era? There's a couple of points I would make. Number one, I think one thing we've all learned, and it's really important, is this has given us an opportunity, this point of reflection, this three, four month period to reflect about our lives, our businesses. And, and for many people, it's been an opportunity to, to learn to open our minds, to change our thinking, to review the way in which we do things, to make resolutions about the way we want to um, conduct our lives personally and professionally going forward. And, and one of the things I believe we've all realized is the, the learning and changing and developing is absolutely an imperative. This huge change has been thrust upon us through the virus, but it's a big lesson to take forward, to constantly look to change, to constantly learn, to constantly develop for us as individuals and for our teams, our people is so important. And I think one of the big changes going forward is to truly invest in coaching and training and developing and mentoring our people and becoming great teachers. And also I think importantly to be taught ourselves. So if you have somebody or people you can trust that you can learn from, that's brilliant. If not, well, frankly, and, and I don't like using this as an advertising platform, but you need people like us, people with more experience and knowledge who can assist you and support you and develop you and guide you and give you counsel. And I, I think one of the things you take from this is that we can't do this on our own. It's very difficult running a business on your own. It's very isolating. It becomes very difficult. You can't share your innermost emotions and thoughts with your people. That's not right. Um, you need people you can trust and you can learn from. And I think your people need that from you and you need that from other people around you. And I think that's one of the things that I would change going into the new era. This, this constant learning, this constant development mode of behavior becomes the norm uh, because we work and live in an ever-changing, hugely developing world, not just in terms of technology, but in terms of attitudes and behaviors. And we cannot stand still. It's one of the things I really feel strongly about as we move into the new era. I think that's an interesting point because I think if I go back into my career, um, I remember having my board directors interview at ADECO. And, you know, the usual sort of thing, there's four or five heads of businesses in there. There was the country head, et cetera. So you're, you're getting grilled by some fairly senior recruitment uh, luminaries, let's call them at the time. And I opened my um, interview with a presentation. And my presentation opening slide was simply make myself redundant. And I sat there going, my opportunity here 
to become a director on the board is to make myself redundant. And it was quite interesting. One of the two of the guys looked at me and sort of thought, yeah, this guy's obviously lost his mind. Um, and I turned and said, the reason I want to make myself redundant is what I want to do is create a succession plan that l links all the way through my business. I want to make sure that the lowest person on the business is learning something constantly so they can step up into the next role above them. Then the next person above them is learning something can step up to that role, etc. And so on and so it goes all the way through, which meant that I was helping my managers step up, which meant that I could do more and give them more opportunity to be better at their job and then take parts of my job, which means that I had more free time to help my uh, bosses and do parts of their job. And so it was all about creating that succession plan. And part of that was having clear staff visible opportunities. They could clearly see what's visible and what's open for them, that what's in it for me type attitude came across. So having genuine career opportunities and not just the general stuff that's here, things that were genuinely happening. If you do this, you will get that. If you achieve this, you will achieve that and you will be received this, etc. And so they weren't just the usual sort of um, idle sort of gestures that never actually come off and the goalposts constantly change it was all about training and development and it was all about making the person believe that they could do the next opportunity and create that and sometimes you were pushing people through into different positions and driving people based on their strengths which sort of make made a strong team and i created really strong leadership teams below me that meant that i could step away and do other projects whilst they ran the business and the business wouldn't suffer and that to me is what even a small company should be thinking about is having that leadership succession plan of what they should be doing to grow the business. And I always say, if you've got a business of five, you should be thinking like a business of 15. If you've got a business of 15, you should be thinking about a business of 40. If you've got a business of 40, you should be thinking about a business of 100. What could you do if you had 100 people? And that way, as a leader, you're always expanding your knowledge and your capability. And I think as recruiters, we work in the here and now. And what I mean by that is that you only work on the jobs that are now on the marketplace rather than lots of talks with our clients about what jobs they will have in the future so you can start to preempt jobs coming in we need to start to really think about what opportunities are there in the future for our consultants and how we can train them what happens when i train them to do my part of the role what can i then go on and do next which is then linking all back nicely to working in the business and working on the business so there's lots of things that we've talked about today that all start linking and interacting and all become a revolving part of your plan and the one thing that paul and i constantly talk about is when we go see new clients and we, we we see new clients and we we usually do an audit day and find out what they're doing our first one of our first questions is do you have a, a strategy and a plan and it's interesting to see how many people will then disappear into a room come back with this dusty document that come back and dust it off and go here i spoke to a client um last week and he said yes we we've got a plan we've been in business for seven years and i wrote it seven years ago and i haven't seen it since and he was wondering why the business was stopping in a certain level and why people had sort of lost a little bit of their mojo due to, to COVID-19 because all of a sudden their plan wasn't working. Their plan wasn't there. Their plan needed to be upgraded. Their plan needed some more momentum to do that. So this is what we're talking about all the time. This is what we do constantly when we talk about mentoring and coaching leadership. It is about trickling that down all the way to the bottom of the business and then bouncing off the bottom and going all the way back to the top of the business again and that is all about creating as i say genuine career opportunities for everybody and implementing a succession leadership plan that moves forward and if you can create that with a really good work-life balance then you're in a really good position to drive forward yeah howard i mean i i often even now i still get asked about um, why did I leave Office Angels? I was there 16 years. And I, I can answer honestly, I spent a huge amount of time developing my line managers. We had, you know, over 600 staff, nearly 650 staff. And I reached a point in the last few years that the guys that worked closely with me um, had become so good, so great at what they were doing, 
that, in fact, when I got involved, they accused me of interfering. So I reached a point where <laughs> it was unquestionably the case that one or two of those guys could do my job and that I considered my, my, my job done. I, you know, I, I now needed to move on and seek new challenges and be stretched further. I didn't want to stay um, doing the same things over and over. Um, and I've never had any regrets about that. I saw my job to do exactly what you suggested as developing my people so that they could ultimately make me redundant. Well, that didn't happen. I mean, I ultimately voluntarily left the business, but in a sense, I, I was made redundant because they were doing a brilliant job. And because they were doing a brilliant job, our business was doing brilliantly. Um, and I'm very proud of that fact. And I think that, you know, nobody wants to keep doing what they've always done indefinitely. You know, we all need to be stretched and challenged. And here's the opportunity as we go into this new era to really look at the people we have and to start to consider how we're going to bring them up to our level, our level of knowledge and experience and skill set so that we can move on, not necessarily leaving our own business, but back to the point. If we want to diversify, if we want to do other things, um, provide new services. One of the, uh, the people listening today has talked about outplacement and coaching. Great. I think it's brilliant. We need to extend the level of our services to our customers for sure. But to do that, you've got to develop people to take over your job and consider it an absolute um, feather, in, feather in your cap when people are more than capable of doing what you do, perhaps better than you do it. Um, that's what we're about. We're teachers. And when our pupils have reached our level, you let them fly, you let them leave the nest. And I think it's really important that we, we develop our guys. We see it as something that's personal, as part of our responsibilities to teach, to guide, um, to mentor. I think these things are absolutely critical and you leave your legacy with people in this way. I think lastly, my last point, because we're running out of time here, Howard, is, is about finance. And I know it's not the most exciting thing to discuss before we finish, but one other thing I would add that we've got to think hard about as we move into this new era is to make sure as best we can that we're building uh, our rainy day funds as we go forward so that we're not caught out by the next economic crisis because as sure as we're sitting here talking at some stage in the future, there'll be another one and you don't want to be caught out. One of the things that I think we've all learned is making sure that we put money in the funds, that we don't have um, the same situation occurring again, where we're caught short when something like this suddenly occurs. And I, I do think whilst I accept it's difficult sometimes, you know, making sure that we don't draw too much money out of the business, making sure we have good quality funding, funding lines that we have, good quality bookkeepers around us, accountants, credit control, and so forth. That becomes vital, I think, as we come out of this lockdown period going forward. So to, to, I think to, we, we've covered an enormous amount today uh, that is the outline of a really good strategy to start to implement. So to give you a sort of run view of what we've covered then, you need a strategy and you need to write it down. It needs to have staff engagement as part of that plan. They need to have that sense of belonging. We need, or I would highly recommend that you do a satisfaction survey on what your staff feel. Quantitative and qualitative evidence means that you can start to move and change your business forward based on strengths and weaknesses within your business. You need to start to look at where your business makes money and where it loses money. So where you are strong and where you're weak, and then look at complementary skills to move that. You need the staff buy-in, the staff's mindset. What are they thinking? You know, you need to have a group meetings, planning and communication meetings. Potentially you need to look at taking projects, divide them out amongst your team and amongst your people and get them to deliver back those projects as part of the overall strategy to give them a, felt, a, a, a feeling of all together and from there. As we talked about requirement analysis over the last 12 months, we really important so you can focus on the re true requirements that make you money and stop working the clients that you don't feel very often. And you therefore you can go back to your client with a far more compelling reason why they should change their recruitment process and what it would do to them with regards to time and money. Clients, again, we should be starting to get feedback from clients on what they truly want from us. So survey the client. We should be looking at lapsed clients and new clients. And therefore, we should be surveying candidates as well to find out what they do, uh, what they want from us, From should I say. We should also look at you know what we could stop doing so we can start doing different things. 
is one is 360 broken would we be in a better way of doing delivering uh, client services and satisfaction to both the clients and the candidates contract versus perm we didn't really touch on today but i think we could touch on uh, certainly yep. next week um niche market versus generalist you know or do we diversify if you're in a really good niche market then diversify out of that niche market but only a small way but really stick to your core market that is where the money will be automate as much as we can to get as much grunt work done so it gives our team more opportunities to be client facing and then look at that contingency versus retained business can we put a process in place where clients will feel the value of our business and they will want to pay us for that money and that is all about then creating an opportunity within the business for each person. So personal coaching and mentoring, looking at career opportunities, making it crystal clear and visible that this is what you will get if you achieve this. There are no move, moving golf posts. And as Paul said, it's then about having the financial clout to do that and grow as uh, do that as you go. And all that is wrapped up by a big, nice bow called communication. How you communicate that back to your business is really important and i think paul i don't think i've missed anything out i think i've no, made you've done a blinding job How quite a number of notes there guys thank you very much again for attending um next week we're going to go through lots and lots of more stuff um if you've got any topics that you really think that you want to cover by all means drop paul and i an email um and find out when we'll find out what those is if we're not covering it then we'll come from there if you've got any comments or any questions you want to ask now feel free if not Thank you very much. I hope you have a super week and we look forward to speaking to you next week. Keep safe, guys. Thank you for joining us. Take care. Bye now.